Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Strength and Knowledge podcast. This is your host, Dr. Josh Funk. I am very, very excited uh, for today's episode. The topic of blood flow restriction has been one that has quickly, I'd say, caught our profession and just the rehabilitation profession uh, overall by storm. There's a lot of different options. There's a lot of different companies out there providing education. There's a ton of different medical devices coming out. But I'm happy to bring to you somebody today who we've had a very, very good relationship with the company of whom he has been a clinical educator for for about four years now. That is Owens Recovery Science. Uh, and his name is Kyle Kimbrell. Kyle, welcome. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, let, I mean, let's dive in. I mean, I just mentioned um, almost this arms race, so to speak, with regards yeah. to the equipments and the uh, different options associated with uh, BFR. Mm -hmm. What are some recommendations that you would give to people who are either newer uh, to BFR, maybe looking to get something for personal use, or to people in a position where they're making decisions for a company? Yeah. So I think, you know, anytime you do something to yourself, um, it, you chose to do it, you know, it's fine. I mean, I have opinions on what I think is probably the best way to do something. And I think, you know, you know, and your crew kind of knows from working with us through the years, um, we really, we really kind of want to use the lowest pressure that we can. Um, and so in order to do that, you have to take an initial measurement, just like you would um, somebody's coming in to, you know, just get bigger and stronger, you have to kind of know what their baseline is, you know, so you got to get a one RM, that kind of thing. So um, you need, from my perspective, to really make it as safe as it can be. Um, and generally, we think BFR, it's best we can tell, it's a really a very safe kind of intervention, but um, you, you need to be able to determine what pressure to use. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of folks trying to figure out how do you do that um, in a bit of an easier way. You know, we have, we sell the Delphi device. It has um, the ability to estimate limb occlusion pressure. Um, and, you know, it's the only device still, despite all the ones that are out there and some claims that are made, it's the only device that has been validated via research against duplex up Doppler ultrasound. So essentially you have a trained um, technician that would go into a limb and look for say a blood clot. Um, and they, they've Delphi validated their technology against that years ago, you know, that kind of stuff. It takes a lot of effort and time and money and those sorts of things, you know? Um, and so there's been a lot of folks trying to figure out, well, can we do, um, like a perceived tightness kind of thing. Jeremy Linicky, you know, really kind of kicked that off years ago um, and, and found that, you know, they could do seven out of 10, but uh, it's really kind of driven a lot by, well, the individual, you know, and there's a lot of trouble with doing it that way. And he has acknowledged that, you know? Um, so I think for me, I, you want to be able to take that measurement somehow, you know, using like a handheld Doppler, you can do that. But um, it's kind of hard to do on yourself, you know. So if you're talking about um, buying it for yourself to use, uh, something that can actually calculate that for you is probably a little bit more efficient, you know, uh, unless you've got somebody that could do it for you. Um, in a clinic type setting, I think it's different, you know. I mean, you you have to kind of look at it from every angle. And for me, in a clinic, when I'm treating a patient, uh, I mean, I took an oath for one to do no harm, um, but I, but I also kind of look at things from the perspective of what if something goes wrong? How do I defend myself? And and because I am a practicing clinician, um, and this is how I make my living, you know. And so um, I want to use something that I can really defend that and and the only way I can do that is to use a device that really kind of follows what guidelines we have with regard to tourniquet literature. Um, you could even kind of say like blood pressure device literature, that kind of thing. Um, what do we know there? And then 
what kind of work has the company that makes the device done to really substantiate that this does in fact do what it says it does. And, and that for me, that's kind of why um, I ended up at Delphi is they're just kind of the only ones that really have done that hard work, you know? Um, and, and until other companies have done that, you know, I think you just, you kind of have chosen to accept a certain level of risk, you know, if it's, especially if you're going to use it on a patient. Um, and, you know, I think that's where we really get kind of passionate. You know, if you're doing something at home, I do whatever you want. I don't, I, I, I'm going to, if you ask me how to do it, I'm going to tell you how I would do it and, and how I do do it. But you know, whatever you do, it's fine with me. You know, <laughs> what did you, I don't know if you saw, um, this is what is December 7th. So, Yesterday, Baker Mayfield just like went off, right? And, and oh, then they were interviewing him. Yeah. <laughs> they were interviewing him, yeah. and he said, "Anytime I do something, I think what would, what is that? I think what would an idiot do? And if the idiot would do that, maybe I won't. I'll try not to do it." Or something. <laughs> apparently, it's an office quote. But <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're free yes. to be an idiot. I'm okay. I with think you it was Dwight Schrute, right? It was like well, Schrute, uh, probably. probably. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so bad about uh, that. Sounds right. I'm so bad about yeah. movie quotes and 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 all of that, but. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that fully answered your question, but um, it definitely does. I mean, I think yeah. for me thinking about not only just using it yourself, but even for the solopreneurs um, and then to be quite honest for myself being in the decision, uh, decision-making uh, role where I'm trying to limit variance and to ensure repeatability. Right. Yeah. So when I think about the, the equipment that we were able to provide that uh, Owens Recovery Science has put a ton of time, energy, and research into. Not only that, but just going through an FDA approval process, there's certain layers of security that definitely put me a lot more comfortable knowing that, to be quite honest, I mean, although it's under supervision with, uh, you know, our DPTs, but we have DPT student interns going through the process. They're learning uh, how to implement this into clinical practice. So for me, like, how can we ensure that we're putting everybody, regardless of their level of expertise, where they're in a situation where they can deliver something that has little, as little variance as possible, that's going to honestly just follow through on many of the research backed uh conclusions that have come as a result so that's kind of where where i'm coming from we've been all in i mean every you know every time we've added a location um that's been on the purchase list yeah that's awesome yeah i I think you know especially as like a you know business owner um someone that's making kind of high level decisions you, you can't you can't decide based upon your highest performers you know it sounds awful, but you have to make decisions based upon lowest common denominators and and those kind of things, you know? Um, And and so as much as I love students, you know, in some ways they are kind of lowest common denominator in in that regard, but, you know, we would teach, um, I taught my support staff to do it. We had, we, we used AIDS. We're all on the floor, you know, Um, we taught them how to do it. Now there's certain clinical decisions you're making, like, for example, the pressure you're going to use needs to be, that's a clinical decision needs to be made that way. But um, I didn't have any problem whatsoever with teaching my staff how to use this device, what kind of things to look for, when to come get me anything like that. And um, it was very, worked very well for us and plenty of folks do it, you know, in that manner. But um, yeah, I, I think you just, I don't, I like to know I've kind of covered all my bases, you know, and, it, and I think for us, the device helps you do that in many ways, because it is validated, you know, I can 100%. say to someone, something goes wrong, like, well, look, we take their pressure every single time they come in. Um, we use the lowest pressure that's been found to be effective, if you will. Um, someone's with this person all the time. We use a device that's validated and here's the papers that, you know, are published showing that these things have been validated. Um, and so being able to say all of those things gives me an added level of comfort of allowing someone who, you know, may not have my level of expertise and experience um, in education, perform that, you know, and, and perform it in a safe manner for sure. So, Absolutely. I mean, I think when, when we talk about BFR too, uh, and you talk about research, obviously there's more and more that has come out 
over the past few years, yeah, uh, you've been with the company for four years. What are some yes. major ways that you would say the application of BFR in itself has evolved? If you were just speaking in generalities. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we had, there was the one paper and I think you had a question about Tendon too. Um, so that was, that was something that, uh, we didn't really know about, uh, in terms of like, how does this affect Tendon? In fact, there were a lot of people that, um, really were concerned about people using BFR because they were worried that, well, you're not lifting heavy. You have to lift heavy to get tendon adaptation, that kind of thing. Um, So BFR might not be good for tendon sort of deal. Um, But there was a paper that came out last year um, and they compared low load BFR to heavy load, um, an 80% load. And they found that basically BFR caused the same adaptations in tendon size and tendon stiffness as compared to that that heavy load group in the the Achilles tendon. now it's one paper and I think it's important to kind of remember that. Um, and so we need, we need more to come out, um, on that front. Uh, but I think the other thing that, uh, well, there's a few things, but the other kind of major thing in the way that I really kind of consider a BFR intervention in a clinic type setting is its ability to reduce pain. Um, Luke Hughes, Stephen Patterson published a paper, late 2019 or it might have actually i think it was 2020 now um looking at specifically mechanistically how is bfr acting on our on our pain centers and what they figured out is that it looks like it's acting on this endogenous opioid release as well as maybe you're eliciting kind of a conditioned pain response so essentially like you give somebody pain they have less pain because of the discomfort that you gave them um, so I think using like BFR, smash your thumb and then yeah. you right. If you have a knee injury, let's exactly. just smash your thumb and let's you make sure you don't think anymore. about your knee. Yeah, you're That's good. exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It works great. You should try it. Yeah. Uh, yeah whatever I'll you do, do yourself. My next patient that me. comes in for sure. Where's the hammer? <laughs> Apply the Baker Mayfield, uh, <laughs> decision making. Yeah. <laughs> what an idiot. Do this. That's going to stick uh, with me. All right. <laughs> you're going to be thinking about it. I'm, I've been thinking oh, about it all man. day. It just made me laugh. When I heard yeah. It. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I think the tendon and pain are, are the two things that um, uh, I, I didn't really see coming. I, th- I think the way that we go about using BFR in the future um, and where I think we're going to see it really change, and I hope we do see this, is for our older persons, um, our people that have neurological diseases and things like that um, where they have very kind of significant impact on their ability to use their musculoskeletal system and because we know that the response to that is for muscle to go away and muscle is so important for our overall health that um, I, I hope that as we continue to get more and more papers on methods um, and, and more on safety uh, and, and then seeing those things implemented into clinical trials that we can really get more and more into our folks that are ill and that really need to put on some muscle to allow them to be more functional and, and all the other different things that muscle really kind of influences. So that's where I, I really, that's where one of the areas where we on the Owens recovery science side of things are very excited about where we think BFR goes. So, No, I like that because I think a, a year like this year, we're talking a lot about public health, population health, Absolutely. right? General wellness. Uh, I think we've done a ton with regards to focusing on high level performers and right for yep. you, let's speak to your like tactical athlete background a little Mm -hmm. bit with people that are police, um, your fire department, uh, but ideally shifting the conversation to, you mentioned it a little bit with regards to, you know, bringing the bottom up clinically and ensuring that your people at the bottom maybe can't make poor decisions or, or utilize a piece of equipment in an inappropriate fashion. But how do we ensure that some of the things that we are trying to accomplish with our high performers are also things that we can streamline and ideally draw parallels to our, our the sickest of the sickest, right? The people with chronic disease to ideally 
uh, help a, a bigger bulk of the population. But uh, I'm with you on that. I mean, obviously with a year where COVID-19 and the word vulnerability is getting thrown around, there's a lot of different things associated with uh, chronicity there. If we were to get back to tendinopathy, though, uh, and you to tell people a little bit more about efficacy, I mean, I agree with you. There's definitely uh, things that will show that if I am putting the cuff around a limb and I am doing an activity that without that cuff used to be painful, oftentimes I'm now actually able to do that activity. Can you speak to some of the intricacies and just the volume of literature that supports the use of BFR in, in some of these tendinopathies? Yeah, well, the volume's small in terms of the number of studies, for sure, you know? Um, yes. Yeah, I, I think that, I think what BFR has done in some respects with regard to tendon or... I don't know if I should say done. Maybe what it will do is I, th- I think it's going to highlight how little we really know about tendon. Um, and, and I really think that that pain side of things um, is a big target for us. I, 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 ha- I got, um, can I say balls? I got, I, got, I got balls enough the other day on Twitter to ask Jill Cook about I know, I know Whoa. about, Whoa. I know about tendon and adaptation and her response to me, uh, she didn't bite my head off. She actually said, Hey, that's a great question. Um, but what she said to me shocked me a little bit because essentially she said, well, you know, tendon doesn't really change much once we get to a certain age. Now I was familiar with you know, the studies looking at like the core of the Achilles tendon or that kind of thing, you know, where they essentially doesn't age beyond like say age 18, somewhere in there. It doesn't, doesn't, and it doesn't change, but she kind of went a step farther with that. And so that prompted me to text a buddy of mine, uh, Eric Mara, who I, you know, a lot of people know. So I texted him and I'm like, Hey, um, what, this puzzles me. And so our conversation really kind of centered around, he was like, you know, I I think what we're finding out is that we need the interventions to knock pain down um, and get people, you know, to where it doesn't hurt. And that was kind of Jill's point. She's like, you know, loading up a a diseased tendon doesn't cause it to have a whole lot more pain, you know? Um, But it, in some ways it gives you confidence and there's other things, you know, but uh, I, I think we've all had that patient where, we just couldn't, we couldn't seem to load up their tendon like we really wanted to for whatever reason. And so then what do we do? You know? And so I think that's, that's where um, with tendon, we have to be, we need research to tell us how best to subgroup those people and to decision make. And, and I think, but I think as a clinician who really kind of, you know, knows the tendon literature and that kind of thing, at least with, with regard to the lower extremity, you probably start loading these people first, you know, but really you're, and, and you see, can they tolerate it? Can they do this? And if not, if, if pain limits that, then you probably, you know, go down the, the BFR road. Cause there is something strange that'll happen sometimes where even just getting the cuff inflated, sometimes um, pain kind of settles down. I've had a few different people uh, report that to me. The most recent one was um, a buddy of mine in, uh, just south of Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, his wife is an occupational therapist, and she had a person post, um, I think they were post op, or it may have been a non op distal radius fracture, one of the two. Um, in any race, distal radius fracture, scaphoid fracture, something like that. Um, we're coming there, developed. we're coming yeah. there in a second. All right. Okay, cool. Yeah, bones, well, yeah, I'm not so, going yeah, bone, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, but right. this person had developed crips, um, and right. they've been trying everything, you know, couldn't get it to. Um, couldn't really get anything to settle the pain down. Pain is always there. And for whatever reason, when just getting the cuff on the person and inflating it settled that pain down for them, um, that compression. And so, you know, the, there may, may be something to the compression. Maybe it's something to disruption in blood flow. Um, and there's other stuff too, of course, that's kind of going on with hypoxia um, and, and yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, for some reason, the, the word neuromodulation keeps sticking out to me. I know that's something that's thrown around more and more and more. Um, but something is, is clearly going on. We've had 
several clinicians, uh, I think the elbows sometimes can get very, 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 uh -huh. very finicky. Uh, and yes. that's an area of the body that we definitely, as a group, um, have had a lot of success with them being unable to load particular movements. And all of a sudden, whatever it is, like you said, it's the cuff, it's the pulsing, it's the hypoxic environment. Um, yeah. They're able to perform uh, an exercise with certain loads that they would not otherwise be able to perform. So uh, I'm definitely with you on that. I'm, I'm looking forward to having more and more and more and a growing body uh, of yeah. literature for that. But if we Same. take this, yeah, if we take this over to bone pathology, mm -hmm. that is something that I think you just briefly touched on it there. But with, with bone pathology, uh, and that being an area of opportunity for us to continue to have conversations with people about facilitating the recovery response. Can you talk about the mechanism behind BFR as it relates to bone pathology? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like a whole section in our course. We have, I think, something like 20 slides or more on it at, at this point. Um, so, and I would consider it still a really kind of unproven, but there's a lot of science showing that BFR hits a number of different targets for bone in terms of just bones health and the things that facilitate bone growth. Um, one of the primary things um, that I think I didn't really have a good understanding of was just how much really bone and muscle kind of talk to one another, um, how they really depend on one another. You know, when Johnny gets going on talking about um, limb salvage procedures and that kind of thing. One of the keys is you have to get muscle coverage over that bone um, because that's integral for that bone's ability to continue to heal. And it helps to um, limit infection and other things as well. But that's a very kind of like you have to cover that bone up with muscle um, so that that bone can heal. It's a very kind of important piece. But then we kind of end up down on, um, on the blood flow side of things, because I think, you know, I was thinking, I, I always try to make things as simple as possible because I'm a pretty simple guy. Um, but, you know, you break a bone, now that oxygen supply is shut off because blood flow has been disrupted, right? Um, so blood flow is, and, and we know blood flow, blood carries all of these different nutrients that we need to heal various types of pathologies. Uh, and so the angiogenic response with BFR, I think is probably um, the biggest thing we're manipulating um, because we can really kind of elicit that via the inflation of the cuff and really exercising and getting more and more hypoxic. And then the body says, Oh man, this is not good. Like I need blood flow. Then you deflate that cuff. It's going to release factors that will increase blood flow to the region. You'll get a reactive hyperemic response, but then you'll also get the release of things like vascular endothelial growth factor um, that are very important for bone to heal. Um, and then, you know, there's other things that we see, uh, BFR being able to manip manipulate. There's a marker called bone specific alkaline phosphatase. Uh, it looks like it's related to, to myostatin, you know, so that might really kind of point to, to really help bone. Maybe you really need to exercise intensely kind of in a, almost in a whole body fashion, because it's more of kind of a systemic response. Um, you know, and then that starts getting more to theory, you know, uh, and then there's other stuff like growth hormone, which I, you know, BFR spikes growth hormone, but it, it's a spike. It's not like a sustained kind of level, you know? And so any, any, any studies that have shown growth hormone leading to bone healing, um, are studies where they've given growth hormone exogenously. So people's growth hormone levels are 300, 500%, whatever above normal all the time. So comparing, what BFR does um, to that uh, is it's a bit of, it's a bit too much of a stretch for me personally. I mean, you might have, you might have somebody that's older, that's, you know, maybe they are osteoporotic and those kind of things. And maybe some repeated exercise, you're getting some of this growth hormone response maybe, but you also have an aged individual in that situation that they're not going to have the same kind of responses um, that, that a younger person would on, on, on that front. So I, I think that one is a bit of a stretch for me. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I mean, for me, I think it's making that muscle grow uh, around that bone and giving it a light load exercise and really kind of working that muscle and then blood flow to that region, I think are really kind of your two big ones um, where you, where you are really probably helping bone the most with BFR exercise. On that same topic and also something that is a current event, so to speak, mm-hmm. I am a very, very big Washington football team fan. Okay. And Owens recovery science was pretty big with yeah. the recovery of our quarterback. You say things like limb yeah. salvage, which you typically don't hear of in a sporting environment, mm-hmm. but that was a situation in which I think he had up to 17 surgeries. They were unsure yeah. about whether or not he was going to be able to keep uh, his foot and a part of his leg uh, as a result of the fracture that he had. Can you speak yeah. to a little bit of, I would say overall, just the level uh, of, of exposure that maybe yourself, the company BFR uh, as a whole has received as a result of things like project 11. Yeah. I, th- I think what we got from the, all the folks that we know, they're like, we wanted to see more rehab, you know, we wanted to see more yeah. Oh, yeah. Of BFR in, uh, yeah. in project 11. Um, but, you know, I think, First, that you know, the Alex's willingness to um, let the cameras in uh, and document that was just really cool, you know, and so and certainly, certainly very special. And and I think um, one of the stories that Johnny told us um, that was awesome was just how much the the people at the Center for the Intrepid who were there rehabbing, you know, these horrible injuries. Um, how much they took from Alex actually coming down there. Cause they've seen all these famous people and whatnot, but none of them ever looked like them, you know, and here he comes in with having had this horrific injury, literally going through what all of them have gone through. And it just resonated. It just hit different, you know? And, and I think that really, you've seen, I've seen a few different interviews with Alex Smith recently where he's kind of talked about that too, how it, it made a difference to him. But um, I think what doesn't get told is what it, the difference it made to the people that were actually kind of there. Um, so, but yeah, we've certainly gotten lots of different kind of questions and exposure because, because of that, you know, story. And then there was the Dwight Howard story that, that came out years ago that Stefani did, you know, I mean, that was how I, I saw Johnny Owens on a veterans day special what six seven years ago um and that really? was how i got that's how i got linked up with him was okay um i saw that and uh or i had seen hannah storm tweet out that um they were going to be at center for the intrepid talking about blood flow restriction exercise okay. and um when i saw that it, it just kind of it, it rang a bell because i had read a paper years and years and years before about bfr and it just didn't tell me anything about how they did the bfr you know and so when I saw that, I'd kind of forgotten about it, but I saw her tweet that and I went, oh, I remember thinking that that thing, that BFR thing, it would make total sense in like physical therapy if there was a way to do it, you know, because we, we have this loading problem, you know. And so I legit like I watched that story. I followed Johnny on Twitter. I just started sending him dms asking him questions and eventually he was like do you just want to host a class man like you're bothering <laughs> you're me. annoying me so much <laughs> learn this uh, thing and come teach it yeah <laughs> so that's that's kind of how i got going with it yeah but yeah, yeah a lot of the, the media exposure i think has really um helped this space in a lot of ways just from obviously from people taking our class and reaching out to us about various different things but also with regard to, I think, just people that are willing to fund research and, and getting, you know, research projects kind of pushed through and getting people interested in research projects. You know, it's, a, it's not an easy task to uh, get people to do a really quality rehab research study. You know, those are not, that's not an easy thing. You, you really need the, the orthopedic community. Um, involved in that. And so I think that's something that, you know, PTs might not quite understand. um, But, you know, stories like Alex's and and various other um, sports, you know, professionals, 
uh, and their use of BFR has really helped move the needle forward with regard to trying to get some really good research put together to really kind of show how this thing works, why it matters, why we should be doing it, when we should be doing it, those kind of things. So um, I think that's, you know, probably a little known kind of side to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say so. I mean, for him to go through that and to be the starting quarterback, and although the yeah. NFC East is not great, I mean, we're pretty much in playoff contention at I think like four and eight right now. Five and seven, <laughs> well, yeah, so. we don't have to talk you know, about how. It's all right, man. You're an Astros fan, so let's, I know, you know we don't yeah. we don't have to go there. We, all have, right? so. we all have our problems with our teams. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm just like, oh man, all right, our quarterback, like you know, uh, almost didn't have a leg last year, and somehow I don't know how he's running around on the field. I mean, I I admittedly have gasped really, a couple times because I'm like. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, no, please don't get hurt again. It's really amazing. You know, I I don't know if he's still wearing, I know that they, that he had an IDEO device, which is that that device that they um, developed at center for the intrepid. It's basically a very, very rigid um, AFO. And um, so I know that he at least at one point had that, but I I, I really, I always kind of look because those things are kind of bulky and I I don't feel like he's, wearing that which is pretty awesome that means he's gotten a lot of strength back um, if he's not having to use the the idea so i agree something that he's using on that on that limb but he i mean if you watch him run he looks pretty darn good he's moving (laughs) amazing it's amazing He's moving. He looks better than, you know, Tom Brady running down the field. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> that's saying much. But, that's um, a low bar, man. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, whatever, whatever that guy ran in the 40 when he was 22 was embarrassing. I, I can't imagine him being 42 now running 40. But um, so, Kyle, I mean, for you, like just to kind of put a bow on today, like what are yeah. some things that you're up to or that you're just looking forward to? Uh, we're kind of wrapping 2020 here. So yeah. uh, I know a lot of people are, are planning for, hopefully a, a, a big 2021 or maybe doing some things they, they, they wish they were able to do in 2020, but they weren't. Yeah. Um, I'm for one, I, I just look forward to being able to go down to the brewery and have a beer. Uh, uh, definitely, I'm with you. <laughs> definitely looking simple forward things. to that. Some of the, some of the simple things in life, you know, getting actually getting to go see my family, that kind of thing would be awesome. Um, but I think, you know, on, on our end, company side, we, we kind of continue to want to help push clinical research forward. Um, There's some partnerships recently that have been developed with some of the veterinarians on the veterinarian side of things um, that I think is fascinating. And I am excited to see where that goes. Um, the folks at Colorado State University, they have a a translational medicine institute there where they do lots of research in, in particular on things like osteoarthritis and tendon and that sort of thing. So um, I think seeing where that stuff goes um, and then we really, as a company, we want to try to put together an event or two at some point to where like we can really kind of engage with folks like you that have been doing this for a while and bring you um you know, maybe some new information, you know, stuff that's just kind of added value to, you know, what you got from our course, what you get from our blogs and our podcasts and and that kind of thing. So trying to put together an event or two like that, that's maybe um, kind of a hangout, but also like, let's learn some stuff while we hang out, you know, that's how I, how I would love for it to go down. So um, we'll see if we get to put that together. We need, we need, we need a little bit of time to do that, but um, right. it's on the horizon. I think I, I want to do it. So, well, if it's going on, I guarantee you that I will be there because I am yeah. very much looking forward to the word presence. Just keeps coming up for me. Like, yeah, I don't. I'm enjoying this, but I yeah. definitely would rather be at the local craft right. brewery place talking shop um, you, in man. person. So I'm, I'm with I, you, man. So, uh, yeah, that's the most fun part. I mean, we, everybody jokes about drinking it like CSM, you know, but it's right. a blast to sit there at the bar and, you know, just kind of shoot the shit and have a good time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I've had, 
a couple different times at CSM, been able to sit down with Mike Eisenhart. I don't know if you know Mike, but yes, bro um, care. I, yep. I love that guy. Um, yeah. And I have a blast just sitting there having a beer with him and talking shop and seeing what he's up to, you know, um, yeah. super interesting. Sure. And so not getting they're doing to do some great things. stuff. Yeah. Oh, for sure. They are. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So not going to do those things stinks. And so I definitely look forward to that, but yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, man. Well, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic for 2021. I know yeah. sometimes that optimism, um, people can view that different ways, but I think at the end of the day, yeah. it's the only way to be, man. Absolutely. Um, no, and not being optimistic. You know, that's yeah. You yeah. gotta be optimistic. You just have to yep. be for you sure. So if you have to, yeah, for sure. And I'm kind of sick of that word too, but that's a whole separate yeah. <laughs> pivot, <laughs> pivot, reimagine and virtual. There's like three words. I'm just absolutely. Yeah. Done. Okay. Right okay. On. Yeah. I'm just, just going to yeah. leave those in 2020. Fair enough. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Kyle, I mean, for people that want to, you know, stay in touch with you, reach out mm-hmm. to you, maybe have some questions um, as well yeah. as just maybe a place to reach out to learn more about Owens itself. Uh, sure. wh- where's best. Sure. Uh, so personally, um, Probably Twitter and Instagram are the best for me. On Twitter, I think I'm at Kyle Kimbrell one, but my handle right now is Astros Elbow because, you know, I, as we as you mentioned, I'm a Houston Astros yeah. fan. It's uh, it's yeah. not a flaw. It's just like my history, you know. Um, but their pitchers had some elbow problems this year, and I got frustrated, and so I just changed my handle to Astros Elbow because I'm like, this season's over. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then on Instagram, I think I'm just at Kyle Kimbrell. Um, those are probably the okay. two best places. I, I don't, you know, Instagram it's pictures. So I just, if something makes me laugh, I'll take a picture of it and I'll put it on there. That's usually how it goes. I'm probably more active on Twitter than, than anything. Yeah. Uh, Owens recovery science, uh, there's a lot of different ways, you know, you can, we have a podcast called Owens recovery science podcast. Um, we try to do one to two a month of those. We It's either myself, Johnny, Ben, and Zach just picking apart a specific topic, or Johnny and I will bring like a researcher on or a clinician on, and we'll just kind of talk about certain things. Our most recent one, we brought a fella named Mark Maniago on. He's at Colorado University, and he is going to do a research trial on multiple sclerosis resistance training with BFR and looking at essentially kind of, is this feasible? Is it tolerated? Well, that kind of thing. And so it's a question we get a lot um, and he's going to look at it. So I think it's awesome, you know? Um, So podcast is a great spot. We have a blog that we put out about every, about every month. We got one coming out just in a couple days here. Um, And then we of course have our social channels, you know, if it's some version of Owens recovery science on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and so we run, you know, stories and we don't, we are not video. I know like on social media, you're supposed to do video. Uh, people don't, I got, I don't, they don't need to see my face, you know? And I think we kind of feel hey, that one way. Of the best beards in rehab. Like, come on, <laughs> let's just show the All beard. Right? Like, that's it. I'm like, <laughs> this is it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So we don't do a ton of video. Um, Cause we don't really, I don't really care to be on camera that much yeah. personally, All right. All you right. know, uh, none yeah. of us really do, but um, we try to put some content out on, on social and try to let people know where we're going to be. Like Johnny's got Johnny's speaking at the um, Centennial lectures for APTA in okay. yeah. summer 2021, which is a big deal. That's an invited presentation. So that's really awesome. And then he'll be presenting uh, a live um, CSM presentation. So not many of them are live this year. Most of them are recorded, but his is going to be live. Right. Um, so he's doing that. So yeah, our website, our, you know, our social channels, podcast, blog, that kind of thing. So. All right. Well, sounds good. Kyle, I really appreciate your time today. Um, I think Great, people man. are going to get a ton from it, uh, and awesome. hopefully you have a lot of follow-up questions, but thank you uh, for joining me today. Yeah. Happy to do it, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me and hope everybody enjoys the listen. Absolutely. Thanks. And hopefully I'll see you in 2021. No doubt for sure. Make it happen.